If you don't see peace, bring it with you wherever you go. If you're not feeling the love, bring love wherever you go. And let's wake up out of the tendency to talk about what's missing or talk about what's wrong. And let's literally fully commit to being the change we wish to see in the world. That's where we're headed. But if we can choose that sooner on a collective level, we accelerate through things faster. And only love can do that. Guy here, my epic guest today is Matt Kahn, and you're in for a treat. What a great human being. We get into the topics of personal spiritual growth, the awakening of mass consciousness that's happening on the planet that's making us look inside ourselves, and of course, how we can thrive amidst the ever-changing world as well, plus many other conversations within this. One thing I'd like to mention as well, if you're watching on YouTube, all the timestamps are below, so you can jump into whatever aspect of the conversation you feel is needed and it draws your attention. Obviously, I like to listen to them in their entirety. That's why we can dive deep in these conversations because one of the greatest challenges is how do we name the podcast? How, like, because we cover so many topics within it. Anyway, let me know where you are in the world if you are watching this somewhere. It's great to always connect and I love reading the comments below as well. There's links for our dates of 2025 as we've settled in for the retreats coming up in Bali, Australia and Europe. They're all coming up through 2025 and hopefully, yes, I get to meet you somewhere, someday in person. Much love from me. See you soon. Matt Khan, welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks for having me. It's a true honor to be here. Likewise, likewise. First question, you're at an intimate dinner party. You sit next to a complete stranger and they ask you what you do for a living. How would you describe that? Oh, my God. I've answered this question so in like so many infinite ways, and it's it, it's always based on the mood I'm in. Um, you know, I remember in the beginning of my career, I would I would talk about myself, and it was before I was really settled in myself, and it would be this long winded elevator pitch that became kind of like a Pink Floyd concert, where I was just, just start talking about one thing, and by the end, who the hell was I'm talking about? Every spiritual word used in one sentence, and. I remember once I was at a party and someone said, hey, what do you do? And I said, I'm in the service industry. That's what I said. I'm in the service industry. And um, usually, I honestly, I just say I'm a, you know, a best-selling author and, and speaker or an intuitive healer. I just kind of say that. Um, just because it seems to be what it is. And um, Yeah. W w what's interesting about the answer, though, and this is where I think I can um, just look in retrospect. I love that question, by the way. Because it gives me a chance to kind of just th think about things a little differently. What's interesting is that in the very beginning of my awakenings and in my career, I would answer the question as a way of what can I say to appeal to this person? What can I say that makes sense? And I would have to explain myself. And it was actually a pattern that I found in many areas of my life, like where I couldn't give an answer to someone without giving a reason why, like I needed their permission to, to liberate me, which a lot of us do. And, and you settle into a level of acceptance in yourself where you just kind of say what is. And, and what I tend to do is like, I'll say, I'm like, oh, I'm, a, you know, I'm an intuitive healer, or I'm a best selling author and speaker. And I don't say anything else but that. And then if they have any other interest around that, there will be follow up questions. And if not, I just literally go back to them. So tell me about uh, tell me about this uh, meatball recipe you have, or whatever the case may be. So I, I think for me, what's interesting when I think about this is that if I'm at a dinner party, uh, which I've been at many, um, for me the growth is I just say wh who I am or what it, what it is, but I don't give any context. And if there are follow-up questions, if there is an interest, I can kind of go from there. And I think there's a level of settledness and maturity in that versus, you know, here's my angle or here's my presentation or yeah, you know, these types of things. So Totally. And you, you raise actually some really good points because it's something I've reflected upon in time because quite often, like you say, you say things to justify your self or your actions and prop it up and it becomes this long-winded thing or whatever it might be 
<laughs> but why do we think? Why do you think um, you, you we don't totally own it and just stand in our in our true power? This is this is me. This is who I am. This is what I do. Take it or leave it. Thank you. I think because if we make a choice, the ego can feel limited by it. Like if I make a choice and I own who I am, well, then they're either for it or against it. It either makes sense or it doesn't make sense. And I think the ego is always looking at how can I be the most appealing to the greatest amount of people? Or And so it's, it's one thing where the ego finds power in a choice and imprisonment in a choice, which of course is the irony of the ego always finds. You know, it finds imprisonment in whatever it defines as liberation. Um, and, and so I think that the ego gets put into some sort of corner because it says, I've made a decision. Now I've got to step into it. You know, and, and when you make a decision and then you have to own it, that's a form of intimacy. And the ego is designed to seek intimacy, but the ego is not designed to receive intimacy, which that in and of itself gives way to all the hijinks and pain that we experience when seeking mm -hmm. relationships becomes building and receiving relationships. Yeah. So I think when we say, I'm going to just say, I'm a blah, blah, blah. I'm a best-selling author. I'm a intuitive healer, whatever it is. When you own who you are, now the person has to receive you. And because the ego assumes rejection, there's a 50% chance of acceptance and a 50% chance of rejection. And so the ego goes into what's assumption of the worst case scenario and says, I've owned who I am. Now let's brace for impact. Yeah. What about your journey and that relationship of intimacy to self then and yeah. fully owning it? Because, you know, what you do is, is unique. It's it from slowly getting to know you through exploring your work to invite you on the podcast and everything. You reach a lot of people, you know, and there must have been a way of dropping into that with comfort now and, you know, and, and embracing who you truly are to yeah. be. And I feel, I feel, cause you know, I, I, I work, I'm in front of people every month and I feel it's a real huge challenge for most people. There's an identity right. crisis and they want to lean into something more meaningful or purposeful, but at the same time sure. are terrified to let go of what it is. Cause there's, there's maybe, uh, insecurities underneath and worthiness underneath sure. fears underneath, you know, all sorts of things that, that hold us back. You know, it's really funny about my journey. <laughs> the, the funniest thing about my journey, and I was, I've been, I've been on stage performing since I was 10 years old. I was an actor wow. just because I found the stage. Like you have, you know, fitness and sports background. I have a performance background. So I was on stage since I was 10 years old as an actor. I was in a singing and dancing group, although I wasn't much of a singer at all. But I was in a singing and dancing group. I got to be in a, Super Bowl halftime show. Like I, there, there's some cool things. I, got, so I performed since I was 10 years old. And performance was there to get me comfortable on stage for the work I do. What's interesting is that a lot of people have this experience of, I'm terrified to tell someone who I really truly am because of fear of backlash or fear of rejection or ridicule. I never had that. What I had was an absurd amount of confidence an inner knowing that I was meant somehow to touch many lives, even though I didn't even know what, a he what it meant to be a healer and what I do for a living, I didn't even know existed. And in some respects, the way I do what I do is kind of my own unique expression. So I never could have known what I was going to do. I just, I just knew I was going to be in front of a lot of people. And whatever it is I was doing at the moment in my life, I did with such an unnatural amount of confidence and conviction. And it wasn't like me trying to be this embellished facade of an ego. Cause you know, even though at the same time I was a little, um, I had a lot of self doubt and insecurity because I was an empath and I could feel people's feelings and I was afraid of hurting people or people rejecting or abandoning me. But whatever I was doing in the moment, like I used to be a personal trainer. I used to do a lot of different things. I did with such conviction 
because there was this conviction that used to just flow through me, which I mean, I mean, obviously it still does, but the very beginning, my awakening, I didn't know what it was. It was just when I commit to something, something flows through me with such conviction. It's like capturing lightning in a bottle. And I didn't know that that was my awakening consciousness. And then as I started going through awakening, things would drop in intuitively like, oh, I'm an intuitive healer. And I'm talking to people in my family. They're like, I thought you're a personal trainer. Well, I am and I was, but something's shifting really quickly. And for me, all of this made perfect sense. Then other people would kind of need time to kind of catch up. But in all honesty, I never had the, I'm so afraid to say mm -hmm. what I do or who I am, or even talk about my spiritual experiences. What was stranger for me is that I didn't understand how other people weren't having the experiences that I was so naturally having. And then I could start to feel how other people had the capacity of these experiences, but I could see what was blocking in their conditioning or in their awareness. And so and I was grateful for that because being aware that everything that I do, even though I've taken many years to refine my craft and to hone my skills, being aware that everyone has these abilities really kind of frees you from it being an even bigger massive ego trip where you think, oh, I'm, oh, I'm the only one doing this. I'm the only one. Oh, fantastic. I'm the only one with this skill set. So it's kind of like being an intuitive, the way I describe it is imagine that you live in a world where you have a very keen ability to smell. And you're living in a world where no one knows how to use their noses for whatever reason. And so people are walking up and handing you things like, what does this smell like? And instead of just smelling and giving your professional smelling opinion, what you really want is to teach everyone how to use their nose. Mm. And so for me, the, the inspiration was, I have abilities, yes, but I sense that everyone has the abilities that I have. And wouldn't it be great if I could use my abilities to help everyone tap into their abilities? And that became the passion and the direction. Um, and, and then gratefully, having this performance background where I've performed on stage in front of, I mean, Super Bowl halftime show. I mean, that's, that's you're in front of hundreds of thousands of people. Wow. And that was actually one of the most relaxing moments of my life because being in front of that many people felt relaxing to me because it felt like the first time the outer reality was matching the amount of energy I feel in my body. And I was wow. so relaxed and was so at home. I literally could have been there standing there naked and taking a nap. I mean, I was so, and, and that's, it's a strange thing to say because some people get in front of audiences, whether you're in front of three people or 300,000 and you know, everyone has the, has their thing for me being on stage is a comfort. It's a home, no matter how small or how big the audience is. And so for me, I'll just share this with you, the difficulty for me that is equal to the difficulty of people mustering the courage and sharing what they do. For me, it was, I knew I was here to be in front of people and, and I started to realize I'm here to help people tap into their connection to spirit. And, and I started to, over time, know I, I'm, I'm here to really do something that, that, that helps people in some way, even before I knew about spirituality. But when you know that on some level and you have to go through the process of growing into yourself and it's like 15 years before it's even going to take shape and form. And there's just this impulse in you saying, where's my stage? Where's, where's the thing I don't even know I'm going to do. That was really difficult for me or the thought of maybe I'm just completely crazy. And maybe this idea that I'm going to be someone is just the same pipe dream everyone has. And maybe I'm just completely insane. And so I went into this field with the thought of I'm either completely onto something or I'm completely out of my mind. Mm. And I always kept that in the back of my mind. And it was a very grounding level of apprehension that allowed me to do the work that I'm doing from, from the very place I do it. And so it's, I'm, I'm grateful for that. But, but the funny thing with me is I have never held back when, I mean, I've had this confidence since I was seven and that was something to be seen when, when it's like this kind of confidence in a seven year old. But, um, yeah, I've had other things that I've had to grow through and overcome. Um, 
And, and I think, again, going back to what we said before, I think it's because people's egos, which is ego is a fine word I like to use. It's nothing bad about it. But when you commit to saying, I am this person, this is who I am and this is what I do and this is what gift I want to bring to the world, you've committed to something. Mm -hmm. And now you have to sit there and see if people accept or deny. And when we're in our egos, our confidence lives and dies by other people's per perceptions. And it's difficult to be able to say, I can have a good experience with this other human being even if they deny what I'm for, or even if they reject what I stand for. Like I could stand in the presence of a person who says, I don't believe anything you do. I think it's all BS. I think you are insane. And I think you are the most despicable human being I've ever met. I could sit there and say that and take an interest in, that's interesting. Tell me more. Tell me more about it. But, but not in a very genuine way. Hmm. Because my sense of self is so connected to my own consciousness and divinity that I'm actually interested in someone's experience of me, and it doesn't threaten my sense of self. It doesn't interrupt my ability to care for this person. Like if I'm in the presence of a person who is completely judging me and they were to have a medical emergency, I'd be the first person to give them CPR because they're just telling me about their experience which has more to do with their history and their journey, and it has nothing to do with my experience. So I love it. It's like that saying <laughs> we, we use often, if you spot it, you got it. And right. But we make it mean so much to ourselves, you know, right. and beyond what it is. Uh, there's, a, there's a few loops you've opened up in there for me, Matt, that uh, I'm, sure. I'm fascinated. But I think I'll go to the most Pre recent one, which is, it feels like, uh, what I noticed on my journey, there was like a leap of faith and, but also a commitment to myself. No, I'm actually in, I'm hundred percent in now. I'm not yeah. flirting anymore. I'm not back and forth and this and that. And that's when I made that commitment to sell my supplement company and, and go in a very different direction yeah. and thought, no, no, I'm all in. But then uh, that's when the ego really, you know, the grapples really came in. But at the same time, that's when things really started presenting themselves because it was as if the universe met me halfway to honor that intent that was behind it, everything. Is that your experience? I, I would say this. I would say that one of my greatest pains in my life was also my greatest gift. I have a great relationship with my parents. They've crossed over many years ago. I still talk to them They're, you know, on a soul level. I had great parents. I had very committed parents. Parents then still the level of belief in me and anything that I was for, they supported wholeheartedly. So that was probably where my level of commitment came from because anything that I wanted to do, they were totally supportive of. So I kind of learned that. At the same time, I grew up in a very emotionally volatile family to where, and my mom, God bless her, both my parents had their issues. My dad was a functional alcoholic and my mom was uh, very repressed, angry, and codependent. And so when my mom was happy, she would scream. When my mom was angry, she would scream. When my mom needed to get your attention. So my mom just screamed all the time. Different justifications, different contexts. My mom just screamed all the time. My mom and dad got in these big arguments because my mom's codependent. My dad's an alcoholic. And, and, um, they would go back and forth. And since I was about 11, I was, I was my parents' marriage counselor. I was petrified of my parents getting divorced. I thought they would both die of a broken heart. And so I became the glue that held their marriage together in many respects. And so I grew up in a family where you couldn't get away from the screaming. I mean, I'd be in my room playing Nintendo or meditating, which was really, that's what I would do. Is I would stare at the screen of home playing Nintendo and I would, I would leave go and I would just have these experiences uh, but you couldn't get away from the volatility in my house and then if you got in trouble I got I got interrogated and if I said this is harming me I feel like I'm being attacked and I need to go in my room I need some space there was no such thing as personal space in my family it was you'll be done when we're done with you and um, there was no safety or nervous system and training you know there was none of that stuff in the 80s um and so I grew up in a family 
where there was no such thing as avoidance. There was no getting away from the intensity and the pain and, and the, um, and the fear. And I learned over time to be comfortable in fire because being around wow. my family that are always this angry, it felt like my body was on fire because I could feel their repressed emotions and their projections and their patterns and all these things. Even though I didn't know what it was. So I learned how to live on fire and be comfortable. And so for me, being all in didn't strike me as uncomfortable or fearful because I spent my entire life being uncomfortable and afraid. And I learned to be very comfortable in it now. That also doesn't help you always choose the best relationships because if you're always comfortable in fire, what do you suppose you're going to be attracted to? But when it came to my career and being all in, all in meant the opportunity to get away from this household, to move out of my house, to make something of myself and to have the right to say, I can choose when I come and visit you guys, not this. I live under your roof, so I got to play by your rules prison talk. And so being all in meant getting away from the volatility and any fear of, well, it's going to be scary to be all in, or you're going to be in front of people and they could reject you. There is nothing other people could do to me that was any more painful than the volatility I lived in my entire life. And that I learned to be comfortable in because that's how you deal with trauma. You adapt to it. You learn to find comfort and discomfort because you have to adapt or you die. And so for me, and I'm grateful for everything I learned from my parents, we had a great relationship. We had, when they both passed away, we all made incredible amends together. And so it's a very happy story. And it was my greatest training ground for being an intuitive healer I could have ever imagined. And, but for me, there was nothing in my life other than all in. And as I was all in in my career and my service to the world, I would constantly have this thought of, I'm either completely intuitive, and this is the surprising turn of my life, or I'm completely insane. And this is all just some wild chapter <laughs> that, that, that has gone way, way out of control. Um, and, and it wasn't until the 10th year of, of teaching on stage 10 years in that I actually started to fully relax and go, okay, there's something to this. And then I realized that the reason I couldn't fully own it was because my ego didn't have anything to really do in the process. And, the, and, and this is, even, you know, and you go through these explosive awakenings and your ego explodes and you think, oh, that's it. But then the ego comes back at a higher level and, and it's, and there's, so, there's so much to the, to the journey, but for me, there is nothing about the work I do that has ever struck me as scary because the life that I grew up in mm. was not only the scariest thing I've ever experienced for my life, which is true, but it was also something I couldn't get away from. And I never in a million years even had the thought of, I wonder why my life couldn't have been different. Or I wonder what would happen if I lived a different timeline or if I wonder it would be different if I had different parents. I never actually ever had the thought of asking the universe to make it different or can you change my parents and make them a little more sane. It never struck me. And I don't know why. It was just a matter of these are the cards I've been dealt and whatever's happening, I'm going to learn from. And I just started studying life from a very early age. And I found myself more fascinated than I was um, afraid, even though it was very, very scary. Wow. That's really interesting perspective. Thank you for sharing. I've never thought of it like that. Yeah, that makes so much sense. Absolutely. So when you, with that kind of, that strong will that, you know, it's innate in you, like you say, and being comfortable with being uncomfortable, when it came to then your spiritual awakening, were you comfortable being uncomfortable while that was happening? Were you seeking it? Were you actively kind of leaning in, exploring, or was it more of a kind of, what the hell is going on here? Well, I really didn't know what it was. Okay. I mean, even though I, yeah, I was, 
starting to do spiritual work and I knew about spirituality, but I didn't know what, you know, I didn't, I didn't know what awakening was. I learned about awakening by going through it. Um, but something to add that I'll share with you mm -hmm. is that discomfort for me doesn't strike me as something to avoid, negotiate with, or turn away from, truly. But my challenge in life has been allowing the goodness to be received. Huh. So I'm in a position where I'm always used to, you know, growing up in school, you have friends, everyone's awesome, everyone likes everyone. And then on a dime, something shifts, no, you know, Someone heard someone, someone said that you said this to this person. I never even said it. All of a sudden, the people that like me have turned against me. And, and you realize in school, the art of tribalism is that you are a hero today and a zero tomorrow. And what you gain will be lost and what comes will go. And I got so used to being comfortable in discomfort. I got so used to the inevitability of loss, change, and death that I would be so good when things would change. So good. I learned to be so good with it. But can I fully receive it while it's here? Or am I just, oh, this has been received. I'll let it in a millimeter and let the countdown to its demise begin right now. And so I feel like I've lived my life, interestingly enough, almost like the angel of death where I'm really good with death. I've helped people cross over. When death is in the room, I am the calmest person there. I'm so good with death, I know it so well. How am I with life? That's been my learning curve. How am I with letting life in, fully receiving it? And that's been my gift. I'll tell you a quick story really quick about the moment I realized this was my thing, but I was so young when I realized it, it would take me like 20 years to process this. You know, when you're a kid and you, you, you have an experience and you see something, but you don't even know what you see because you don't have the maturity to really like grok it. So I'm a kid. It's Hanukkah time, which I was raised in a Jewish family, you know, so Hanukkah, you get gifts every day for seven days. And I remember, you know, this is, I mean, it's in the eighties. You got Transformers, He-Man, G.I. Joe, and I had all the action figures. I had every set, I had everything you could imagine. I open up my Hanukkah gift and it's the series of Transformers and this G.I. Joe set I never even knew existed. So not only am I, at that moment, I'm not even the coolest kid on my block because I have the things we all know about. I have something no one even knows existed. So at that moment, I am, I open up this gift and I feel the surge of, I have something new and unexpected. And as a kid, I feel, oh my God, I've got this new toy. So good. So I take my Transformers and G.I. Joe, and I go back to my bedroom and I close the door. I take everything out of its box and I take all my G.I. Joes, my He-Man, my Transformers out of my toy, toy chest and I assemble in my room the biggest battle scene that I could have imagined with the storyline of G.I. Joe, He-Man, and uh, Transformers are going to war. And I set this up in every inch of my room on shelves, everything. I get ready to act out the best epic battle I could have ever imagined. And I'm very young at this time. I'm like between seven and 10. And in the middle of getting ready to start this, so I set up the battle. Now I've got to commit to it. Now I've got to receive the moment. And in the middle of it, I stop. I literally stopped and I had no idea what was happening. And it's like, it's like the room went still and time disappeared. And I literally sat down in the middle of my room and stared at the floor for about 10 minutes. And my mind was completely blank. And all of a sudden, the only thing I could feel was how crowded I felt from all the toys, all the stuff in my room. And then I literally got up one by one, took them all down, put it in my toy chest to put everything away, didn't play with it, not even once, and sat back down and was totally silent and just kind of stared at the floor in this blank space. And looking back, yes, there's the spiritual teaching of, oh yeah, stuff doesn't define you and what comes goes. But it was showing me 
my big life lesson in this, in this journey was, yes, you can acquire, you can seek, mm -hmm. you can have, how much of it will be received? Or are you just gathering things and then it goes away? You're good at mourning the loss. You feel like you're in a state of detachment. But for me, the healthy thing I've had to learn is the healthy side of attachment. Receiving things, appreciating things, getting great use out of things, valuing things. So for my journey, just to tell you this whole story, for my journey, loss, change, it's easy for whatever reason. I've had to work at receiving. I've had to work at getting, deriving meaning from what I've allowed myself to acquire. <clears throat> and that's, and that's been an incredible life lesson. And, and that's for me, why throughout my journey, <clears throat> there's so much intimacy in how I teach the transmission of consciousness. There's so much intimacy in how, when I teach about awakening, because for, for me, there's always been a commitment and it was never like for a lot of people, it's like, oh my God, I'm all in. This is so scary. Awakening wasn't scary because awakening in the very beginning was just endless change and death. And I'm good with that. And even the scary of like, it feels like I'm losing myself. For many parts of my life, I'd have these moments where in the middle of life, I would forget who I was. I didn't have this attachment, not even to myself, but then coming through awakening and the awakening of consciousness and the rebirth of the soul. And now you're integrated and embodied. Now you have to commit to life. Now you have to actually fully show up and you have to fully receive and you have to fully be the mystery within a greater mystery. That for me was my challenge. Wow. Do you feel that? more and more people are waking up. Do you feel like the planet is simmering and it's like popcorn and it's, <laughs> you know, it, it's starting to yeah. pop more and more and more. And we just not really taught or equipped with those kernels starting to go off within us, you know? I would say so. I would say that right now, if we want to, because it's funny when you, if I said the world is waking up at a faster rate than ever before, and then people will look around the planet going, really? Yeah. But I think the way you, you can tell whether people are waking up is you can tell the rate of awakening by the, the amount of hiding spots. And so what we have is consciousness waking up in large amounts of people. We have people becoming disenfranchised with, um, you know, the clarity of message through legacy media and people feeling like, wait. Mm -hmm. I think I'm being misled or deceived or, you know, the idea that, you know, there's these different sides in an argument and behind the scenes, both sides are kind of run by the same group. And, and I think people are kind of getting on to things like this at the same time. We have these uh, created things like technology, which do help us. I mean, right now we're using technology to have this conversation, which is wonderful, but technology is an attempt to create greater conveniences in a society run at an unhealthy speed. And so I think we have the pressure of consciousness waking up like, like greenery or little flowers that poke through cement on a sidewalk. And we have things like technology and other different things that are actually the things we wake up from. Of course, we'll still use technology. It'll just be used in a non-addictive way, in a non-compulsive way. So I think right now where we're at in history is we have this pressure of two forces kind of colliding. And I think in the next six months to 12 months, we're going to start seeing consciousness wake up out of the old paradigm and it's going to look like the wallpaper of the things we thought were true or taught were true just peeling yeah. away in all directions so i think the unsettledness we feel 
and the amount of addictive hiding spots that exist to try to keep one lulled in a cocoon is the quiet or the calm before the storm. So yes, I think we are, we are in a radical level of awakening. And within the next, I'd say three to seven months, that's going to become even more obvious. I love your analogies, by the way. They, they really paint a great picture. And it kind of makes me self-reflect on, again, my journey, because that it's, it's those hiding spots within ourselves that we haven't acknowledged. That's what it really starts to come back to, doesn't it? It's what is it within ourselves that is not sitting in the truth of who we really are and what is just a false identity that is Well, well absolutely. And I think, you know, we all have hiding spots, right? We all have hiding mm -hmm. spots. And, um, you know, sometimes a hiding spot is because I'm afraid to be honest because I'm afraid I'm going to get rejected or abandoned or abused. Um, sometimes the hiding spot, I mean, every, it, it's for so many different reasons for, for me. I never like, even from an early age, before I knew about spirituality, I never really felt like a human being. And I know a lot of people will hear this and will resonate with this. Like when I learned about like alien beings, there was always this, like, I'm probably from there, wherever there is. Like, I'm probably from there. Or like, you know, you grow up this fear of like being abducted by aliens. And then like, as you get older, you're like, that's probably my family if that happens. It's probably like, Steve, what are you doing here? And so even from an early age, I never really felt like a person. I was experiencing life as a person but I felt like I was in this kind of play or movie where I'm on stage and cameras are on me and I am playing the role of this person named Matt Kahn. And I'm literally in a play. I'm literally just acting out and following a script or sometimes breaking script and improv -ing. But for me, the hiding spots that I had were because again, my, my growing edge was living fully in the world and I, I didn't know how to reconcile that I didn't know how to be a person because I didn't feel like a person. And so what's interesting is it takes awakening, an awakening of consciousness to realize you are one with source and that source created form for you to express yourself through. It takes that type of an awakening to be comfortable in your own skin and to enjoy the experience of being a person. And so again, like I said, change and death and pain and all these things and awakening and Kundalini awakening and, the feeling like I'm on the brink of death made me feel the most alive. But my journey has been accepting myself as a person, enjoying myself as a person, and being able to receive all the sensory pleasure and all the beauty of what it means to be a person. And that's, for me, what life outside of my hiding spot is all about. Yeah. I also want to ask you about being an empath and yeah. one common kind of complaint I hear from people or perception of being an empath, and I could see you smiling already because you probably know where I'm going to go with it, is that I just take on too much. I take on other people's things. I can't deal with this. And I'd love to hear your thoughts because I believe it's resonance. We, we're choosing to resonate with that of another and I'd love to hear. Well, I would say that you, you're, yeah, you're I would, highly I would, empathetic. Say, you know. Oh, absolutely. Well, yeah. you know, I mean, I, 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 res I, I. Part of me goes, well, I'm jealous that there are people that think they have an option. At the same time, by me not thinking I had an option, like I never had an option within my family. So when I'm feeling, well, and for me it was a mystery because what would happen was my mom would be angry. And I could feel her anger in my body. And then I would have this codependent instinct to try to change myself to see if my behavior changing could change her anger because I didn't want to feel her energy in my body. I never ever learned about people's idea of like, I'm taking other people's energy. That never struck me. It was just, I'm sizzling and being electrocuted in energy. 
And I learned to be so comfortable in volatility that I just began to explore it. For me, it was literally like an, ex an exploration of why is this happening? What am I feeling? Huh? Okay. So, and then I would start to study this like over my whole lifetime, like, okay, so they're angry. I'm feeling it in my body. And then I think it's my responsibility to act different, to see if I could change it. And I would like just start studying. Like I'm, I'm, it's like learning how to play chess by just watching someone move things on the chessboard. You just are studying things. And over years, you start to kind of get on to, I think that's what this is. I think this is what's happening. But for me, and this is what I want to add to the story of, or the, the uh, conversation of being an empath, is when you go through an awakening of consciousness and you realize in all of your being that all is one. So we, we seem like separate characters, but there's one source animating itself as the, all these characters. So if we're all one, that means there's one infinite pool of energy like an ocean. Mm -hmm. And the individuals are like these different waves in the ocean. So like imagine you see an ocean and you have waves that come and go and you have a wave that goes, I can't stop taking on that wave's energy. And the other wave says, yeah, I'd have a better day and be at a higher vibration if I didn't take on your stuff. And all these waves are talking about taking on each other's stuff. And it's just the shape of the ocean. And so in truth, we don't actually take on other people's stuff. What happens is, is we use our mirror neurons to tune in to other people's bodies. And the reason we're doing that is because our energy field is clearing someone else's energy field. And what we are feeling is not what we're taking on. It's what we're actually lifting out of their field as empathic healers. If you don't know that's what you're doing and if you haven't been trained to understand that, you will, fee you will go in through a default setting and you will actually just replicate their conditioning and add it to your conditioning because you're perceiving it through the lens of conditioning. Or you'll heal something in yourself and then you'll feel, you'll fill the space with more things to heal if you've learned or if your ego has learned about clearing energy patterns like, oh, I can clear my cellular body. But Matt, it came back 10 minutes later because your ego is now in this addictive pattern of needing things to clear. So it feels like we're taking on people's energy or it feels like other people are making us more fatigued. But when you're run by your ego, you're using your mere neurons, even though your energy field is clearing people's fields, you're actually recreating in yourself what you feel in another person. And we usually do it to try to build up amount of density to keep ourselves safe and protected around other people. So as we feel safe in ourselves, as we learn what empathing is all about, that we're all one, which means there's one energy field and we're all just interesting ways that the field is animating. There is nothing from that perspective that one takes on from another, right? There is no tidal wave that can be big enough to drown the entire ocean. But what we learn to wake up from doing is using our mirror neurons to replicate other people's conditioning, add more to us. And again, people would say, well, why would I do that? Why would I add more to me? We do it because we're trying to build more armor so that we can feel safe in the presence of other people's perceptions, judgments, reactions. And of course, the irony is the more armor we build, the more unsafe we feel. The only way to truly feel the safest is to learn how to live without any armor whatsoever. Beautiful. Do you feel, oh, I'd like to um, at least get your opinion on it, that the more yeah. we heal ourselves, so going in, reflecting, healing those wounds, those traumas, yeah. letting that energy flow, allows us then to have the ability to manage that empathy at a at a, a more aware level, I guess. I would say that when you heal yourself, 
which is a journey of self-awareness, self-care, self-love, right? self-compassion, self-forgiveness, all the self-words, right? When we heal ourselves, when we learn to relate to ourselves and treat ourselves the way the divine always does, it's not that the empathy gets managed, it's that it actually becomes an intuitive skill set versus an unconscious mechanism of emotional codependency. So for example, if I'm talking to this, if I'm at, if I'm at a brunch table with a bunch of people, I can feel everyone's energy. I'm not always tuning into everyone. And, and, you know, I'm at a place where I'm only tuning into people psychically if I'm working with them. As soon as I'm working with someone, all sorts of information comes to me and it floods me. And the minute we stop working together, it, it you know, I am only psychically aware of what the universe is trying to tell me. The only time I'm aware of another person is if I need to know something like, hey, give this person a little space. Their, their liver is overstimulated. They're flooded with anger and they're about to pop, which is what I call when someone snaps. So I'm aware of it from a, from a, you know, an awareness, an environmental awareness standpoint. And you learn to use these abilities just in talking to people like, oh, I'm sitting at a brunch table and I can feel there's tension in the air and everyone feels just a little short tempered. And maybe I'm with a group of people and I had something really incredible I wanted to share. Well, my, my empathic abilities will scan the table and say, maybe this is the time to go into that right now. Let's just read the room and just balance out what's happening and let's just hold space for what's occurring. Hmm. So when you're empathically aware, you le you learn to read the moment you're in. And even though there might be things you want to share or do, you learn that what comes as a higher precedent as you're moving through life is holding space for the experience other people are having. And so then it's not just about what serves my experience, it's what is going to serve the experience we are all collectively having together. And so from that place, you're using your emotions and you're using your awareness and you're using your intuition as an agent of unity consciousness. Not just what's going to serve me, but what is serving the greater good of everyone involved. Beautiful. I love it. it and it makes me want to pose the question. I wrote this down at the start, Lee, because the word love has come into the conversation. Yeah. Um, and I thought I'll ask you this question because it's written on your website. But in a world of endless questions, love is the only answer. Yes. Please explain. Well, I think it's easy when you ask, when anyone asks a question. And again, there are questions like where, you know, how many blocks to the train station? That's an easy question. But most existential questions or any questions of any kind of depth that we have within us, questions that come from fear, anxiety, doubt, confusion. On the level of content, every question has its own validity. So it's not like questions don't matter. They do matter. But for every, list, for every viewer who's watching this, how many times have you had a burning question within you? And even if you found an answer, your mind then goes to the next burning question and the next burning question. Mm -hmm. And you re and it's almost like having a small child, if any of us have been parents. And you realize answering questions does not seem to stop the precocious curiosity of this beautiful, radiant, evolving being. And then you realize when your parent mind jumps in and you go, oh, yes, they have questions at face value. But the questions are just used as, as devices to spend time with the one that they want attention from. And hmm. so what if we took the way we would raise a child in our infinite wisdom and we apply it to reparenting our heart and being the mother or father? Maybe we had that we lost or maybe we never had. And we say, yes, my questions do have validity, but maybe the circular nature of my questions is because the inner questioner is wanting love, is wanting attention, 
but is afraid if it asks for something too big, it's going to lead to rejection, humiliation, abandonment. And what if instead of asking directly for love, that then it has to wait for some form of rejection it anticipates? What if it just demands attention through the appearance of a question? And what if what we learn in all of this is, what happens to the nature of my questions when I love the questioner instead of take the questions at face value? What happens when I love the one who has a question? What happens when I love the curiosity within a question? What happens to doubt when I love it? What happens to confusion when I love it? Not that I love being doubtful or confused, but what if I said, all my emotions are like children and living inside my heart. And whatever feeling arises is the next child in line just waiting to be loved. And they're afraid to ask for love. So they demand attention through these devices like questions or judgments. And what if one by one, whether it's a judgment or a question, I just say, I see you and I love you. And you're safe to be here with me. The feeling that you just felt is why in a world of endless questions, love is the only answer. Can you, wow. If, if we all took that on board and really started to bring that into our lives on a daily basis, yes. the world would not look like or it does right now with the challenges That's that right. arise. You know, it, it's think, interesting. Yeah. I was going to say, my daughter is four years old yes. and she is there right now. Question after question after question. And it just, it just makes me smile and warms my heart. Like, you know, it's like, wow. Yeah. Beautiful. Sorry. You were going to say, Matt? No, it's, it's, it's true. I was just going to say, I remember a couple of years ago, I channeled a quote that says, if the world could stop for one, if the world could stop and give every person the benefit of the doubt. Even for one split second, world peace would be achieved. That's all it takes. The reason why hundreds of thousands of light workers have to work so hard to raise the vibration of the planet is because as this consciousness spreads, more people do, do less. And in order to get there, fewer people have to do more. Right. So how, how hard have light workers been working to anchor this light to spread to a certain point where literally if every person on the face of the planet or if a certain percentage of the world, just like, you know, they'll say in protests, it only takes 3% of the population in the country or in whatever to demand change and any government structure will change. So all it takes is 3%. Wow. That's I a statistic that. right now. So at what percentage of the world, like if we had what, 20%, 50%, if we just stopped and just for one moment looked to the person in front of, behind us or to the side of us, and for one moment viewed them as a member of, of a family we didn't know we were a part of for one moment. All of this stuff would instantly vanish. And through the fourth dimensional fabric of time, what people perceive as global warming would instantly reverse itself. That's all we have to do. And so then we use time to say, over what period of time are we going to motivate the world for that type of precedent setting moment? Right? You put people meditating in the middle of a town square and the prisons nearby have a reduction in violence. We've studied these types of things. So over time, how many people, like the universe will say, it only takes one person to wake up completely, like someone named Jesus and, and Buddha. It takes one person waking up completely to change the world. And that's a true statement. But the fine print in that statement is what happens when a large percentage of us at this, you know, at virtually the same time, all decide to be that one. Hmm. That's when it actually happens. So it's not just one person doing the whole thing by themselves and then they get this amazing merchandise deal and 
they're on candles and all sorts of stuff. What happens when each of us decide right now, I'm going to be that one. I'm going to love like those who came before me. And I'm going to love to be the course correction of anyone that lived before I came to this planet. I'm going to be all that was missing from my lineages. I'm going to be all that was missing from my ancestry. I'm going to literally look at what's missing from this world right now. And I'm going to be that for myself in the world right now. I'm going to stand for something. I'm going to stand for love. I'm going to stand for peace. When we all decide to be that one, that's when the potential of this planet and people say have it on earth because the destiny of earth is to be the heart chakra of the solar system. The solar system is a chakra system and earth is the heart in its mm -hmm. potential. That's why we're all empaths. That's why we have nervous systems. That's why beings from other star systems that zip around in UFOs, they have all this high technology. What don't they have? They don't have nervous systems. They don't have a sense of individuation. They don't know what it's like to feel. They don't know what it's like to be inspired. They don't have creativity. That makes human beings one of the most advanced civilizations, but we're unaware of that. So as we step into our full potential, yes, our alien brothers and sisters have this technology to help us have free energy and that's all going to happen. And what we give these other civilizations an opportunity to do is to experience what it's like to be consciousness as an individual with a nervous system, with emotions, with inspirations, with doubts. And so when we as human beings, which human beings is one of the most advanced radiant expressions of divinity and form, when we all decide to be that one, when we decide to be the love, that this world needs when we decide to be the peace that we want to see in the world. That's when it spreads at a radical rate, which we're already seeing slowly, but surely, but when it gets to a certain tipping point, the earth manifests heaven on earth becomes the heart chakra of the universe. And we'll have seen that all the things we're going through in the world, which is participating not only in our individual awakenings, but the awakening of an entire civilization. That's what we're all experiencing right now. And it's quite profound. It's humbling and it's exciting. And sometimes it can be very overwhelming. Mm. I love it. And just to, this is a great place to wrap up the podcast, Matt, I, I feel, but I just got to ask you, do you feel that tipping point is coming through yes. your intuitive experience in life? Yeah. Well, but you know, in life, the way the creation cycle works is you need like people will think that birth is followed by death, right? I came out of the womb and I'm living my life and there's going to be a time where I leave the planet. People think birth comes before death, but that's what makes you afraid of death. In truth, death comes before birth. Like people think sunrise, then sunset. Okay. When you're in the womb, your experience of being in the womb has to end, has to perish, has to die before the birth into form begins. So we actually first experience death. Our first experience of being alive, like, cause you're alive in the womb, but then our first experiences of the death of being in this beautiful womby experience. And so when you understand death happens before birth, kind of like when people say, I want to manifest my soulmate and I'm going to take care of my body and I'm going to do yoga and I'm going to cleanse my body. And all of a sudden, they start seeing all these deaths in their life. All of a sudden, certain friends leave my life because the universe has to clear the space, has to create a sacred space to give you room to receive something of a higher reality. So right now, what we're looking at in the world is life clearing space. And so we're seeing all these opposite sides colliding socioeconomically, politically, all these different things. And so to answer your question, yes, I do see a radical awakening coming. Whether we need to go through this clean sweeping experience of destruction for the next year and a half or three years before we start to see it. And the opportunity is the, the rate at which people have already been awakened allows us to move. It's, we, we can't avoid what we're going to go through, but we can go through the movie at a, in a more fast forward direction. 
So when you go through an action film on fast forward, it all looks more intense. So the reason why things look pretty crazy is because we're going through this faster than we would have had not more people started to awaken. So you either go through it slower and it's less intense, but it's agonizing and it's pacing. Or you go through it faster and it's a bombardment mm. of what is happening. So we're moving through this faster. Within a year, within three to six months, we're going to start seeing why, why and what's really happening. For the next couple months, things might be like, you know, you think about all the different things that can happen. What we're seeing is everything's happening at once. It's because we're moving through the fourth dimension at a radical pace because the fifth dimension is expanding in such a profound way. So within the next three months to six months, you know, you're going to see, oh, okay, I think I'm getting on to something. Potentially within a year and a half, we can start to see in a collective level people really starting to kind of come together and assemble. And if there are things that people would call negative in the world happening, I would say we would give ourselves three years before a huge expansion of something bigger. So we're right in the thick of things. And, and I think that we're all going to see it very interestingly. We all see it differently. I'm just using my intuition to kind of, and it's hard to give timelines, by the way, because time's always changing, right? When your consciousness is changing, timelines are always changing and it makes life very um, malleable. But I, I would say, that through the, you know, we make our way through 2024, we ground, we stabilize. 2025 is going to be a, uh, an incredibly interesting year. Mm -hmm. And if we know that the time we have, even in the face of holy, you know what happening, this is a chance for me to be that which is missing from the world. If you don't see peace, Bring it with you wherever you go. If you're not feeling the love, bring love wherever you go. And let's wake up out of the tendency to talk about what's missing or talk about what's wrong. And let's literally fully commit to being the change we wish to see in the world. That's where we're headed. But if we can choose that sooner on a collective level, we accelerate through things faster. And only love can do that. Only love can do that. Absolutely. Matt, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. I've really enjoyed your, your wisdom and your presence and everything you've had to share. It's greatly appreciated, mate. Where can people find out more about you if they want to look you up? Where's the best well, place? My to website is, well, I appreciate that. You know, my, my, and, and I just want to say thank you for having me on your beautiful podcast and, and for all the people that are watching and thank you for the honor of, of getting to know you and connecting with you. Um, I really have enjoyed you and this podcast and, and I hope we can do it again sometime. Um, for those that are interested, my website is metcon.org. And when you go to the front page and scroll to kind of the middle, you'll see my free documentary, Healed by Love, and put your email address in. It also gives you our free Sunday newsletter of all the things we're doing, teachings and upcoming events. And the documentary was created to give people a living experience of what it feels like to be healed by love. And um, we're just so honored. My wife and I are so honored to be serving the evolution of humanity. And till our dying breath, which we don't, per we don't perceive as coming anytime soon, but till our dying breath, my wife and I are here to serve this world and to no matter how dark or how uncertain things appear, we are here to serve this world with love and kindness, no matter what. That's our, that's our all in. Hmm. All in. Thank you, man. Much appreciated. Thank you.